Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Lightning Interview Series. As always, we want to make these sessions interesting and interactive. So please do introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining from and, of course, what you do. And do feel free to add your questions to this conversation. Now, today's interview, as you well know, is with the very distinguished Professor Michael Jordan from UC Berkeley. And I must say, one of the world's most respected authorities on machine learning, and I have to say, a very, very astute observer of the field of machine learning. And I've had the pleasure of hearing him speak both at ODSC and a number of other events. But first, there's always a few quick words about upcoming events here at ODSC and AI+. Plus. Um, so we've got a number of free webinars coming up. I think you'd be very interested in, uh, first of which is um, on January 25th. And that'll be followed at the end of the month on uh, low code. A lot of people talking about low code, no code. Um, and then, of course, everyone's pushing machine learning and deep learning to the edge. So there's another free webinar on architecting uh, for running ML on the edge. And of course, you can catch these interviews um, on our AI Plus uh, platform. We've had some great interviews recently, uh, just at the end of the year with Emily Robinson, who you see there, Peter Abiel, Alex Ranter. And um, we do have Pedros Domingos um, coming uh, next week. And of course, we have our major event of the year. We just wrapped up our Deep Learning Summit, actually. Sorry, our uh, Data Engineering um, Live Summit uh, just a few days ago. And that's going to be followed by ODSC East in Boston. Uh, we're back in person there over three days in person and four days virtually. So hope to see as many of you as possible either um, in person or online. And in addition to that, um, there's all kinds of stuff going on there. So go, go check out the website. We have free passes, scholarships, um, training passes. Check those out. And um, check out our AI Plus uh, training site. Lots of stuff on there, machine learning, deep learning. And I think we've got, say, a course catalog now of about 3,000 videos available for free to check out. And then some certification on there as well, as, in addition to other great stuff. And um, as you kind of heard me say, we used to do this at all, all our conferences. We had this, um, I know a lot of people here are interested in either upskilling, reskilling, or um, getting to the next level from practitioner to manager. Um, we built this little, uh, we had this COVID project. And um, over the last couple of years, we're, um, we used to do this in person, but now we're doing it virtually. We take your resume, we apply NLP to it, and we basically, um, chosen my words carefully here, find all the available jobs that are freely available on the internet and match it to them so you don't have to be doing that. So it's free to um, individuals, and then if companies want to use it as well as a community service, they can uh, get free job postings in there as well. So using AI to um, figure out your AI job search and trying to get get by all these um, automated systems they have these days. So on to the main event. Um, I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, uh, the incredibly accomplished Michael Jordan, who is a distinguished professor at UC Berkeley and has made, as I mentioned earlier, significant contributions to uh, the field of AI. And in 2016 was named um, one of the most um, influential computer scientists worldwide. An article, I believe, was in Science Magazine and I was checking Google Scholar this morning and see that Professor Jordan has over a quarter of a million citations. Um, I can see my notes there. It was 250,301 to be exact. I'm sure that number just went up. Um, he's also a member of many distinguished associations, including being a fellow of the American Association of the Advanced of Science and has been the recipient of many awards, um, including the uh, ULIF, uh Fernander Prize from the American Mathematical Society in, that was in 2021, and the IEEE John Van Neumann Medal in 2020. Professor Jordan, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, my pleasure. Now, that's quite the impressive uh, CV or resume, as they say here in the US, um, but um, knowing a little bit about your background, your research, um, and your interest, my guess that your journey to machine learning has been anything but linear. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what's influenced your journey, so to speak? Uh, yeah, great question. It, it, it's a journey, and, and partly the size of my CV reflects the fact that I'm a little bit old, um, and I'm an academic, so it's uh, it's been an um, you know it's a lifestyle where I I don't have any boss and I get to choose what I, I do. So sort of every five years I. I head off and work on something rather different than what I did before. Um, 
just so I can kind of get a bigger picture. You know, the, what's the landscape? Where are things going? Uh, what are the pieces that are going to be needed? What are we kind of trying to assemble here? Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's uh, I'm more excited now than I've ever been. And the topics I'm working on, I'm, I think, are really uh, uh, important and fun to work on and uh, impactful. Um, but um, I can't even hardly remember how I got started. But, you know, when you're 18 or 20, you're kind of interested in, uh, at least I was interested in philosophical issues about what's thinking and what's, how's the brain work and, and so on. And I still think those questions are fantastically important to think about and inter interesting. Um, but they are still rather philosophical. And I eventually became more of an engineer and more of a person wanting to have real world impact and you know, contribute to science and technology in our, in our era. Um, and so that kind of helped shape what I've done. Great. And let's kind of get into it here. Um, definitely want to talk more about your research. And I think you're on sabbatical right now and what you're working on, or rather not working on. Um, but what is your definition of machine learning? Because in the number of talks I've attended, who you present, this, I've heard you say it's a blend of pattern recognition and decision making, which is um, very insightful. Can you um, elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, I think it's, uh, I don't really, I'm, first of all, I'm not going to have a definition and I'm going to kind of say why. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, pattern recognition has been the focus of the last 10 years, or it's certainly the one thing that people talk most about, you know, finding patterns in large, large, vast collections of data and uh, making those patterns be useful for various purposes. Um, but there is a whole other side of the field, which is consequential decision making. Uh, how do I ensure that I don't make you know, huge errors when I make decisions. Um, you know, how do I put various decisions together, you know, various people together, uh, multiple agents? And and then how do I think about doing this over time, not just over an hour or a day, but over, you know, months or years? Um, so that's kind of a little bit of a flavor of uh, what machine learning is, uh, you know, what some of its big themes are. Um, but I don't think it's really a field yet. And um, mm -hmm. I say that when I think... Uh, what, uh, historically, about what's the, what are the you know predecessors in, in human history that are that are like this era, and, and I think it's it's really the emergence of a brand new engineering field, and I liked uh, I so I actually looked into chemical engineering a little bit, uh, you know it emerged in the 30s and 40s, um, and before that there wasn't a field called chemical engineering really, uh, there there was chemistry there was quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, it was understood, there was fluid flow, there was understood what happened in a test tube if you put molecules together, what would, what would form. Um, but the idea that you could actually build something out in a field, a factory, that at huge scale uh, would, uh, you know, take in inputs and produce products and, you know, eventually produce brand new kinds of products like, you know, plastics and, and uh, very useful product, you know, medical um, products and so on and so forth. Uh, that was, you know, not, not at all clear that could be done in the 30s and 40s. Um, and so people started to do it. They started to take what they knew about chemistry and fluid flow and thermodynamics and all. They started to build these big, you know, uh, well, factories and, uh, and some of them just worked fine. And some of them, probably most of them didn't work. Uh, they didn't produce product at all, or they produced something different, or they just didn't work at all, or they exploded and hurt people. Um, and, uh, over time, new principles emerged, uh, how to put things together, um, modular ways of thinking about an engineering problem. Uh, you know, control theory kind of emerged uh, partly because of that era. Um, and, and so that the, the, the field eventually got called chemical engineering, and it obviously changed our world. Uh, and, you know, if you go back further, you know, electrical engineering, very similar. Before there was electrical engineering around 1880, there were already Maxwell's equations. So it was already understood what the phenomenon was, but the ability to bring electricity across the city or to, or to wire a house or to build a circuit or to do communications, radio, uh, those were all things that were not envisaged yet, and people started to try to do them, and it was hard, and, and eventually, you know, principles emerged to support that. And I think that's very much parallel to our current era. We, we have this rough idea that, you know, with lots of data, we can make find patterns, make predictions, we can imitate humans, we can um, do this at large scale, at planetary scale, we can bring things together never brought together before. So we're building factories in some sense that are, you know, large scale, planetary scale factories that uh, use data as kind of their raw ingredients, um, but also human knowledge and human uh, aspirations. And we build systems that hopefully work, that do something, you know, they, they, they do commerce, they do uh, transportation, they do um, education, you know, entertainment or whatever. 
Uh, and so those are kind of our modern factories. And and I I, I think the analogy goes even further. They're, they're, they're partly working and they're partly not working. And we don't really quite have yet the principles of what what's what, what how do we build these things? How do we make sure they're safe? How to make sure they uh, scale? They work for ten years. They they don't hurt anybody. They they you know privacy issues and so on. Um, and just to kind of close that line of argument, um, you know the the previous waves of your developments of engineering fields is sort of every fifty years. Um, you know, have uh, changed our world more than just about anything I can think of. You know, it was supported by science, but the engineering fields were the ones that really impacted human life. Uh, and so that includes, you know, civil engineering as well, building buildings and bridges and uh, and um, mechanical engineering and, and so on. Um, this is the first engineering field where uh, human uh, or humans are inside the engineering discipline. <laughs> Uh, we're not just designing it. We're uh, we're it's about humans and it's about human you know data and it's about human values and culture and business models and all that. So it's a it's probably the most challenging engineering field ever thought of and envisaged. And and so I think that's actually what you know AI slash machine learning is right now. You know other people have different definitions from kind of academia or from you know the the what what people aspire to do like you know AI people aspire to have thought in a computer. Uh, that's not what's happened. We don't have thought in a computer, um, and it's a fine aspiration. Nothing wrong with it, but it's not what's happened. And I think what's happened is instead this kind of you know, large-scale building of, of large systems uh, in new, brand new ways. Uh, and we still don't really know what the principles will be of the emerging field. And so that's a long answer. Um, I hope you saw in there something of a, that approaches a, a definition. But I think if you'd ask someone back in 1930. You know, what is the definition of chemical engineering? They wouldn't have been able to say, and, and they wouldn't have captured what was going to happen over the next few decades. And similarly for electrical engineering. No, um, very, very good answer. Very illuminating answer, Professor Jordan. Now, um, you gave a talk uh, back in ODSC in 2019. You just gave a recent one, but this is, this is going back a few years pre-COVID um, about blending um, machine learning and microeconomics. And I was very fascinated by that talk. Um, has your thinking evolved since then due to the advance in the field of machine learning first? We just talked about, you know, large language models and all that good stuff. But the um, economic impact of COVID, um, especially the behavior, as we saw, of individuals and companies during that period of time. So just just curious, like, looking back from 2019 to now, um, if your thinking has, has, has evolved somewhat or changed due to these more recent developments. Uh, my thinking hasn't changed due to the recent the chat GDP and all that. I mean, I think that's that's fantastically interesting and, and exciting. And I didn't, you know, I, I knew that eventually, you know, pattern recognition would get better and better and better. I think it went, you know, faster than most of us would have imagined. Uh, but the whole other side of of you know uh, building new markets and and uh, and producer consumer relationships with data um, that hadn't changed at all. In fact, it's kind of clear to me that it's even more pertinent and the, the challenges are even more interesting. And we made a lot of progress. Um, you know, so thinking about asymmetric information situations where you have a principal and an agent and you're trying to get the agents to do things, but they don't reveal their data because it's not in their interest to do so. Um, thinking about market building exercises where you have a two-sided market. Um, those are all very, very pertinent in, in, in real life. And, and, you know, in, in thinking about business models in, um, uh, you know, thinking about what what could be the socially useful uh, um, uh, you know, aspects of these of this new technology, um, it's more and more pertinent. Um, so maybe just to give a concrete example, um, this one I've used, I think, and then perhaps in the talk, um, I've been involved in with with a uh, a friend and colleague uh, who's uh, in the music business, uh, you know, leader, a uh, leading producer and uh, an entrepreneur uh, named Steve Stout. Uh, helping create uh, a company called United Masters. And it uses data analysis, machine learning, um, you know, two-way market kind of thinking uh, to link musicians to, you know, to the people who are listening to them and link them to brands. So a musician, instead of just putting a song up that's being streamed on a platform and the platform makes money from advertising or, or a subscription, uh, instead, the musician gets to know who's listening to their music by seeing a dashboard. And they uh, are associated with brands who will uh, actually hire them and uh, pay them when their music is being used. Uh, so United Masters has over 2 million musicians signed up. They create their music. It's on that platform. And, for example, the National Basketball Association uses United Masters music now behind its clips. And whenever you watch a clip and, that, and some music is being played, it's going to be probably by a 16-year-old or a 19-year-old, not by a famous musician. 
and the the 16 year old or 19 year old is getting paid when you watch that clip so it's it's literally a three-way market there's uh, producers who are the musicians and again they're often young people who are making the exciting music on their home laptop that a lot of people are listening to um and those musicians are uh, their music is being um produced and then made available to the nba it's being used the nba is paying the musician um and then the the listeners are people like us who are also connected to the musician we can have our favorite musicians and um uh, there's a more of a direct connectivity between musicians and listeners uh so so that model to support that there's a lot of kind of economics thinking about incentives about long tails about um uh you know how does data how does data get used here how do you achieve fairness how do you achieve a healthy market um and uh thinking that through has kind of led to a company that's really quite viable and is is not using advertising as its key uh way to make money it's, it's instead building an actual market um so um so anyway that that gives a little flavor of uh you know that's on the non-technical side this is more on the if you go out in the real world, you see new companies kind of thinking about what their business model is. And often I think it's better to think about, well, who are my producers? Who's, who are my consumers? And maybe my goal should be to kind of do lots of data analysis so I link them in the best possible way. And in economics, these are called matching markets. Uh, but in economics, there wasn't much data analysis to support the matching market. It was just that everyone had preferences and you matched people based on their preferences, like in college admissions. Uh, but we have this new world emerging where we don't know our preferences are. I don't know what musicians I prefer. I have to experience them a bit. But as I experience them, I start to become linked and economic value can flow based on that. So it's a very different way of thinking about what machine learning can be done on a platform. Uh, it's a little more close to what uh, like a commerce company does. Um, um, you know, so like Amazon, uh, you know, their business model was originally to you know ship packets, packages between producers and consumers. I mean, they still do quite a bit of that. Um, but advertising wasn't the main component of that. It was literally uh, help the packages flow and uh, then take a, a cut of that as the way as the business model. Uh, so I think that's a better model or it's an interesting model to, to consider for our field. It, its job is to support the building of pursuit producer consumer markets at, un, you know, hitherto un, unthought of scales, you know, millions to, to, you know, billions of people being connected in various ways. Yeah. And I think that's, that's amazingly insightful because um, my background is electrical engineering. Then I went to um, quant finance, to data science, to machine learning. And it was only when I started listening to your talk in 2019, I really started to think about um, these uh, two-sided markets because it made me realize that the system I was building, it was, a, it was a single agent system where only that agent knew about um, the data was coming in, running those models that the um, consumers, users on the other side, they, there was no agent acting on their behalf, right? Um, and so I think, you know, this whole concept uh, you had brought to my attention of two-sided marketplace places within the um, system design was, was extremely interesting. And I think that's a great example you just gave about um, that uh, music industry where the person has an actual dashboard. So do you see companies, um, you know, tuning to this more because like, just a chat GBT, by the way, um, everyone's saying it's a, what is saying? It's a, it's a red line for Google for their ad revenue. And to me, again, people are thinking about these, these technologies in the same way. Um, so any, any thoughts on that, that people are? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, nothing bad to say about chat GBT. I think there's a, you know, there will eventually be a business model there and I'm perhaps not smart enough to know exactly what that'll be. Um, you know, but, but they're, they're, you know, when you think about business models, um, you know, advertising and subscription based just can't be the way the world runs. It just can't be our future right. uh, as the main way to, to, to make these things uh, useful to people. And, and and so you ask about companies. Yeah, companies are already doing this kind of market, you know, think style thinking. And, and so I spend the day a week at Amazon. And just to give you a little bit of a flag, I mean, they've been doing machine learning going back to the 90s, early 90s, really, or, you know, mid 90s, um, you know, to find patterns, but then also to do logistics decisions and so on. Right. One of the things that Amazon does is they have something called FBA, furnished by or you know, fulfillment by Amazon. Um, so if you're, uh, you know, you produce some um, some product somewhere and you don't want to do all the uh, the inventory management and stockpiling yourself or the shipping and all that, so you let Amazon do that for you. Um, and so you send a bunch of your items to Amazon and then they handle the rest. 
Uh, well, now you have various decisions to make about how much inventory do you keep and when do you get rid of the inventory, what prices you set, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Amazon doesn't really know how to do that themselves based, they don't know the product that well, right? And, and so you, they could ask the, uh, the, the producer, uh, you know, how much is your product worth or make a prediction and everything. But the user is actually not incentivized or the producer is not incentivized to tell Amazon because if they tell them, uh, you know, uh, they can get a cheaper price if they kind of hedge a little bit, right? And this is how all of us are. If you, if an insurance company is coming after you, know, wants to sell me insurance, health insurance, um, they're going to set a price and they're going to ask me some questions like, how much do you drink? And I'm going to say, well, I don't drink at all. Uh, or how much exercise do you do? Well, I do a lot of exercise, right? And so, uh, so economists have thought about this a lot. These are the problems of uh, information asymmetries and incentive structures. And uh, how can you set things up so that both sides actually get the best out of a deal and, and under these asymmetry conditions? Um, whereas the kind of the, the, the current machine learning style thinking, the federated learning, the chat GPT doesn't consider these issues. Uh, it just says, well, I can gather data wherever I want to. I can go and grab everybody's data uh, on the web and I flow it back centrally to me. I build my model and then I make it available and then hopefully I make money. Uh, well, that's just such a limited perspective. That's not how the world wants to run. The, the world wants to have agents who possess something of value. Maybe their own data is valuable. Maybe they don't want to give it to Google. Uh, not just because they want to be paid, but also there's competitive re reasons or or there or there's privacy reasons or there's just, um, you know, uh, if I don't give you my data or if I if I lie a little bit, I'll get a better benefit. Um, and those aren't perversive incentives. Those are real incentives. That's what happens in real life. Um, so if you don't take that stuff into account, you're going to build stuff that just in some senses uh, as a toy or uh, uh, makes money for a small number of people. Um, like it did for Google in the search engine, um, but is missing out on all the real big opportunities. Um, so I, I do think it, and that, you know, chat GPT aside, just thinking about how do you use machine learning uh, in the real world, it's things more like this, uh, you know, FBA or something. It's more like uh, somebody wants to do a service. There's some other people out there that they want to engage with, but information just doesn't flow because you want it to. You have to incentivize and you have to structure a deal um, you know, in economics, you have these things called contracts, which are lists of if this happens, then this happens. If this happens, then happens. It's not just here, here's a price. It's rather here's a price if this happens and so on. And then you get to choose in the menu. So it's like business class, economy class on an airplane. They don't just give you one price. They give you a menu of options. And the reason is because, of course, there's more people will, you know, get on the flight and uh, everybody will be happier, um, uh, you know, because of the menu of options rather than a single price. And I don't hear machine learning people talking about those issues, about how do we structure the output of our system so that it's a incentive compatible mechanism of some kind in the real world. Um, and, and so that to me is really exciting because I do know businesses do talk this language and they use classical microeconomics, but they don't have any machine learning in their microeconomics. They assume everything's already known a priori and then they structure their contract or their auction or whatever. Uh, and they assume the distribution's already known and, you know, they, uh, and they go from there. Well, we have this huge opportunity. Machine learning can learn the uh, ingredients of the mechanism, be it a contract or a matching market or, uh, or an auction or whatever, or develop new kinds of mechanisms that have been talked about. Um, so to me, this is kind of where machine learning really starts to make an impact on uh, the real world, on, um, on you know, companies and business models and, you know, and, and humans as they relate to other humans. Um, and just as ex more exciting to me than ChatGPT, frankly, ChatGPT is, is great. It's interesting. Um, it's a tool, um, but I, I'm more excited in this. Um, you know, how do you ha get people to meet up with other people? Kind of issues. No, no, no. You 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 bring up some excellent points there, and your er earlier points about the um, the insurance company example. To this day, I'm I'm still amazed with engineers who who have blind faith in essentially what is data quality. Because despite how much we know about bias in this many forms, um, years ago I used to work at a uh, polling company in the UK, uh, doing uh, political polling, and they talked about a lot about um, social desirability bias. Like when you're asking questions about who do you want to vote for and who do you not want to vote for and things like that, and people would um respond to these questions in a way that they believe is uh, socially expect acceptable or desirable rather yeah. than finding their true thoughts, right, or feelings. Um, so as practitioners, um, and I know some people are aware of these problems, but this is where you have a bias, and, and that, a bias, and then you induce bias to overcome that bias. 
So, so how right. do we as practitioners tackle some of these problems? Because th these are not easy issues to tackle because um, for, for reasons mentioned. Uh, well, you, you, know, you did a great job of outlining some of the issues. Um, um, I mean, just to say, these are issues that things like insurance companies or loan, you know, banks who are trying to give people loans have tackled. You know, uh, it's not as if they can't be tackled. Uh, and, you know, they have their, uh, you know, the ways of doing it. Um, you know, sometimes they're like multiple paths or, you know, uh, several stages of commit. Um, sometimes they ask questions that are harder. So if they ask me how much I exercise, I can say I exercise a huge amount. If they say, show me a receipt from a gym as one evidence, you exercise, well, that's a little harder for me to fake. And um, so, you know, you do things that are, you know, build up trust over time so that, you know, there's a commitment partially made and that incentivizes you to do certain actions you wouldn't have otherwise done. And, and there's all sorts of, these are called mechanisms. There's all sorts of strategies. There's usually not just kind of one, you know, price or one, uh, you know, one output. It's a, it's a, it's a process. And, um, you know, in, in real world auctions, you know, for example, this happens too, like the you know, auction of spectrum. You don't just run a, you know, uh, English auction and you're done. It, it's a whole sequence of things that happen. Um, and when, we, when he, we as humans go into something like a real world market, if I go into a, you know, a bazaar in Northern Africa, you know, I don't know much about the world there. It's very complicated, all kinds of things I've never seen before, but I get some idea of how to interact and I maybe probe a little bit. I try um, and, I, and I and I do eventually get value out of it and I pr bring value to the market. And so humans are very, you know, ad adept at actually sensing uh, how, how to interact in these environments and build up just enough trust so that they can do something so that something else happens. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you, uh, you have to structure these, these engagements. You have to think ahead a little bit. Um, and it, it, in worst case thinking is probably not the right way to go. Um, you know, uh, you, someone could arbitrarily lie, um, but you know, you can sort of sense that, or you can also structure it such that an arbitrary lie is kind of not going to get anybody what they want. Um, and you know, the, so the, so anyway, there's a, there is a field called economics, which, you know, microeconomics, which thinks about this a lot. But like I say, the big opportunity is that they haven't used it in this iterative context of bringing in data and analyzing data, which is what we real humans do in a real market. We don't just go in with our preferences already known. We sample, we try, we talk, we discuss, we have social networks that permit data to flow in interesting ways and helpful ways. And all those things aren't part of classical microeconomics. Uh, right. well, that's, that's a huge problem solving opportunity. Bring those in. And now what can you do? Well, you can do a lot more and they're going to be you know, highly relevant things. So, um, so incentives are important to talk about. And uh, when data is being gathered, you have to be aware there's quote unquote bias and some of it's inadvertent. Some of it's the way you gather the data, but some of it is that you didn't, you have to think through your incentives to make sure you have some control over the bias. And Professor Jordan, you mentioned um, banking and insurance. These are heavily regulated markets, right? Yeah. And um, we hear a lot about the need to regulate AI. Um, do you think there's there's a need for government regulation for AI in the, in the context of the framework you're, which you're outlining? Well, there's definitely a need for regulation. There's always going to be a need for regulation for any sufficiently powerful technology. No question. There's regulation of electrical engineering, of electricity, of chemical engineering, and so on and so forth. Um, but you know, uh, uh, and, and this is not my level of uh, area of expertise. So just to be clear, um, you know, what kind of regulation and when it comes in and what, how is it most helpful and productive is, is not at all clear to me, certainly, and I think to most people, um, I don't think it's a good idea to regulate too early, uh, because you really don't know what the phenomenon is. And, and we say AI as if we know what we're talking about. And as I kind of alluded to, I don't think we do. I, I don't think we know what AI is going to be, uh, over the next couple of decades, um, and so regulation, I think, needs to be kind of gentle. If you, if you regulate, you, know, you can be at cross purposes and you can regulate and create perverse incentives and so on and so forth. And that I'm sure is going to happen. Uh, it'd be better if it somehow didn't. So I would say, you know, we have to be careful and be gentle about it. But then eventually we realize what needs to be regulated. You know, regulate. Um, you know, you can't just go put a wire in a house. You know, there's regulations on how you put, install it and how you and and that has to be the case here. But again, I just don't think we entirely know. Um, if you say I'm going to regulate, insist that you have you know zero bias estimators, well, that's a meaningless thing to say. Um, if you say I'm going to have perfect privacy, that's a meaningless thing to say. You know, so for example, privacy uh, to me it's an economic concept. You know, I I don't want absolute privacy. Um, I want to be able to give up a little privacy. You know, supply some data about myself if I get some benefit in return. So if I enter into a market, 
and I reveal something about myself of kind of maybe things that, you know, if it's a, like a restaurant market and I reveal I like Sichuan cuisine and I like to pay about $20 and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, then uh, I'll get something to return, which is I'll get good offers from the other side of the market of things that I value. Um, and so I've given up a little privacy for a particular purpose. And that's, I think, the way to forward with privacy. It's, it's to, in part, bring it into the economics of it's a trade-off of uh, give up something, get something, quantify that, make it like a currency. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a little risk and, and, and I get it some benefit. Um, and so we don't know what that language exactly is yet. And so regulating and say, we, as if we already know what privacy is and we already know what AI is, and we're going to impose that, um, you know, I, it, 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 I think at this point it would be mostly counterproductive, you know, although a little bit of pressure, uh, you know, pure libertarian open you know, uh, development technology is, is dangerous itself. So a little bit, but gentle. Right, exactly. And um, so talking about privacy, which is a big concern, one of the reasons we need to regulate AI. Um, you mentioned um, federated learning in one of your talks as well, and I know that you co-authored co a paper last year on um, uh, incentivizing data sharing and federated learning. And you know, the promise of federated learning allows us to, um, you know, we want to have models that are trained on decentralized data from, say, different companies um, who have different requirements on that data and without the need to centralize and, and, and um, share this sense of data. So you and your uh, co-authors propose an, a new framework. So I think you've already kind of touched upon why you think that's necessary, but I would love if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think nowadays, in fact, it's often started to be called collaborative learning, uh, just to kind of change the dialogue a little bit. Um, one model is the classical federated learning. It was, you know, uh, that, that terminology was first used by people at Google. Um, you know, even though some of the ideas had already been presented in papers that were outside of Google, just to say, um, but they, they, they gave it that name and, and their model was that they were Google. They were trying to collect huge amounts of data to build a centralized model indeed. And, uh, the economic, uh, you know, side of that was completely implicit. Um, you assumed that people were just willing to give up their data. Uh, you assumed that, uh, they were going to give up true data, that they weren't going to shade it in some way. And you assume that this centralized model will be immediately of value to everybody. Um, and um, there would be a business model, et cetera. So there's many economics assumptions that are completely implicit. I'm not saying they're wrong, but uh, they, they're implicit. And um, I think a better way to think about, construe the whole problem is to think more about the, the, the edge. Who's on the edge? Is it just devices or is it actual agents? And do they possess data they care about? Um, and it's not just privacy. So, you know, if I possess medical data, um, yes, I'm, I might think of it as private, but also I'd like to think about, well, what is this central site going to do with my medical data? Um, are they going to study a disease that runs in my family, for example? Well, then I'm all in. Or are they going to use it to set insurance rates? Well, then maybe I'll help out a little bit, but I'm not all in. Or if they're just going to use it to, you know, to make money off of advertising, maybe I'm not in at all. So I'd like to have a knob to turn uh, that uh, you know, reflects my level of engagement. And... Um, and then, then, like I talked about with the asymmetry of information, the principal agent model, uh, well, I'm an agent and I don't want to just give Google some information that Google, you know, wants because I want to, you know, work with Google. I maybe want to, you know, get something, they, they want something out of me, I want something out of them. And we need to make that all explicit and it has to go back and forth. Moreover, there's free writing issues. I mean, I have some, you know, something to give Google and some data perhaps, but I know that you have, you know, very much the same data I have. And I know if you supply data to Google, maybe I don't have to, that I have no risk. And so there's got to be a way to think, you know, there's free writing as a concept, again, in economics. Like how, how do you avoid it? How do you make sure that things are shared? How do you deal with public goods where it's supposedly a benefit to everybody? Um, and then how do you ensure that actual benefit does, you know, accrue to people? And benefit is not just that there's a big model out there available. Um, you know, benefit, it may be more localized and more heterogeneous. Uh, you know, so um, I may have some data that's really pertinent to my local situation, but sure, if I could take, you know, a million other people's data and bring it in, that would even be better. You know, I could, uh, you know, I could have a model that was, it was better for everybody, but also for me locally. And my needs are maybe a little different than yours. Um, so this would be heterogeneous uh, federated learning, or really, again, what I think of as collaborative learning. We're trying to kind of collaborate. We allow things to be shared. 
so that, you know, locally I can do something even better than I would do, but my thing is different than yours. And so that model is more focused on what happens at the edge and the value accrued to that and diminishing the role of the central platform. And again, I think the, the model of federated learning has been more focused on the central platform. What do they get out of it? And, and uh, the value that then they uh, accrue that, um, that, again, supposedly helps all of us. Um, but I mean, you know, hopefully that's clear that, yes, I think there's a, a broader topic here and it's a really important one. And, uh, and, and it's got to be uh, in most situations, uh, you th have to think about active agents on the edge, not just mere devices that stream data and not just privacy is your one limitation that has an economic side to it. No, again, um, very insightful. So um, as we know, last year was quite the interesting one in the world of AI. Um, Dolly 2 generated uh, a lot of noise um, as it's stable diffusion and people creating um, very interesting things like the um, last selfie of humanity. Um, but it kind of pales to comparison to the excitement and, and um, the excitement and the angst generated by ChatGPT, which we talked about a few times. And, um, you know, just reading a little bit yesterday about um, everyone gathering at Davos this year, I guess that's back on now after two years hiatus or last year was scaled down. Um, it was interesting, like um, everyone I'm talking to is using it. My kids are using it. Um, Got to find out what they're using it for. But it was interesting, this article mentioned that um, all the CEOs at Davos are talking about ChatGPT, using themselves, um, and the angst here is these CEOs of very powerful companies as well as um, world government leaders are all over this. So what advice would you offer them um, as they kind of rush into this, what they, what they view as a new dawn for AI? But for most of us working in the field, it's an improvement in pattern recognition, as you mentioned. So um, what advice um, would you offer them if you had to address the, uh, the world stage at Davos, so to speak, which, which you may be, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know your, all, all your agenda, Professor Jordan, but what advice would you offer them if you're in that position? Well, I don't have a lot of sympathy for, you know, a company that has been out of the loop, you know, that, uh, you know, fine, it's a new tool that's very powerful. And if you weren't already ready to use it and think about it, you that's too bad for you. Um, you know, so I watched IBM, you know, with Watson and uh, they, they just were not going to solve the problem that they really were claiming in all their big advertisements they were solving. So I felt, you know, too bad for you guys. And uh, if now GPT just makes them look silly, which I think it does, um, you know, that's 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 all the better for whoever is going to come on and use, you know, maybe it's Microsoft at this point that's coming back. Um, and if Google's search engine is kind of now diminished, you know, I've got no problem with that. I was very happy. Google, I think, helped change our world, made it a better place in the 90s. Yeah. But that didn't mean that Google's got to be, you know, um, for the rest of our lives or the rest of my children's lives, the dominant force in the world. I, I have no... I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much a capitalist in that sense that made the better product win. Um, yeah. So a little less facetiously, you know, I think it's a, um, it's clear there's some business models to be built here, um, you know, but it's just like, you know, Uber, um, you know, it was a brand new business model. It kicked out some, you know, the, the, you know, some aspect of the previous transportation model and people had to adapt and scramble and some, you know, um, some companies perhaps went under. Um, overall, the effect on human life was probably favorable. Um, it's not, you know, it's still to be written the history, but um, a lot of us have gotten around on Uber very, very effectively in ways we didn't get around in taxis. That's that's probably good. Um, and I think that, you know, if I just think of the search engine, it's been great for 30 years or whatever. Um, but, you know, using an interface like this where I can talk to it a little bit more and it can kind of, you know, craft it a response for me, that's great. Um, I, I don't see how you're going to make money off of that right now. Um, you know, I hope it's not just pure advertising play. <laughs> I kind of think we've had enough of that. Um, uh, you know, but on the other hand, it's not, uh, you know, I think the people at Davos are, are probably, you know, the, not able to kind of construe where the line is. What, what can this do? What can it not do? Um, I think those of the fields, others of the field mostly still feel that there is a, a big difference between a real human interaction and and a and a GPT three one, um, and and it's it's um, I mean some of it will just kind of go away over time, um, you know. But th there definitely is a uh, a missingness. You know, you can't interact it with uh, you know over long periods of time in, a, in the same way you can with a human, right? A human, well, you and I are building up a model of each other. We're building up a model of the things we're talking about in the world, we, and that model is is it's real. It's not just it's just not in the statistics. 
it's real and it's 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 a novel model to reflect novel things around us and uh, we refer to it in our in our conversations and it's kind of there uh with with chat gpt3 that model's not there and, and so it's talking about things that could be true that sound great it could be true in some possible world that doesn't mean it's true in our world all right and, and at some point you'll get frustrated with that you'll sort of say well chat gpt3 that sounds really good but it sounds like bullshit to me and it'll say oh i'm so sorry you know yes that's bullshit uh, here's something that's maybe less likely to be bullshit. Um, and so, um, you know, can you, can you fix that? Well, you know, at some point it gets to be hard. I mean, there's little things that you can fix. You know, people have kind of said, here, it does something stupid here. Well, you know, the engineers of whatever company eventually try to monetize this will fix every little use case. I mean, just like with the self-driving cars right now, they're not on the road, really. Why? Well, because there's all these little use cases they kind of screw up in, right? And so it'll take another 10 years for some engineers to spend all their lifetimes fixing up a little every edge case. And I think that's true with ChatGPT3. There'll be all these little edge cases where it doesn't do the right thing. Um, you know, so fix it up so it does okay in that, in that situation. Um, and this kind of goes a little you know, against the spirit of just machine learning does everything. Um, but it's kind of adding in the right data and engineering. And in some sense, well, any engineering system has got to be this way, like a chemical factory. Um, you know, but it's kind of less glamorous and it's also kind of clear that you're sort of cheating at that point. You know, it's going to be just kind of fixing it up so it does some purpose. It's not solving the underlying problem of what is the truth and how do I get at the truth in a conversation and how do I model uh, what's really happening uh, in the world or in the social environment that we're talking about. Um, and and so, um, so that'll take some, you know, decade or so to kind of, you know, patch use cases. And I think the... the um, the real serious uh, interactions between humans will still want them to be with humans because we, we, there's, there, there is just, you know, I think we'll have come to a better appreciation of human intelligence through this, all this, by the way, uh, we're not going to be just satisfied with something that sounds good. We're, we're going to want something that really we know has been thought through that it reflects a, a lifetime experience that reflects maybe some position. Uh, someone, if we sense that they're trying to, you know, sell us on something that's maybe good or bad, but it, they, they're trying to do something. Whereas ChatGB3, it's not clear what it's trying to do. Uh, we, we want to know that something's attempt, being attempted there. And, um, you know, so uh, I think we'll appreciate more what humans are about. Also, the kind of the creative abilities you mentioned, like the image generation stuff. And you can generate images, you can generate songs, you can generate books. Um, they'll all be, you have their use, you know, um, generating marketing copy or generating stuff for legal cases and, and so on. Why not? Um, but I still think that most of us will want to read a real book or hear a real song from a human. When I say real, reflecting the human experience, uh, the cultural experience behind it, uh, but also a thinking the ability to reason in, in the in the moment and 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 bring in ideas that were not in the data, um, and in 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 new ways, which will that, that's part of the agenda of AI. And I think in a hundred years we'll have all the above from AI. But we don't have we won't have that in the, in this in this Davos you know conversation. We won't have that in the next five years, um, and so instead, you know, be really clear on what it is, but what it what it is not, um, and be clear there will be lots of fakery. There'll be lots of people saying, "Well, I got a system that will, you know, help you with you know your stock investments and all that," and you can have a conversation with it. Well, just be clear that that thing is not really understanding something about the the real world, and. Um, and and medical you know discussions it's it's not really understanding medicine and biology and 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 so be clear that you're what you're getting there uh use it for as a tool i can imagine with a doctor you'll want to have a doctor and chat gbt3 and yourself in the room and you're all discussing the three of you and you're using it as a tool just like people use you know x-rays as a tool at some point but you won't trust the output of that alone you will want the interpretation from the doctor and the dialogue that you have with the doctor bringing in context and facts that were not in the data originally that ChatGB3 just doesn't know about. So in that sense, it's a very useful tool in the room, but it is not going to, you know, replace humans in many, many, many situations. Yeah, no, I think it's an absolutely brilliant tool. Um, they'll definitely work on improving the uh, the well-known hallucination issue. But I think um, when I've had discussions with people about ChatGBT, I, I take a kind of a different approach with because to me, it's again brilliant tool, but it's a it's a somewhat established paradigm because I go back to, um, I think it was an ODSC talk you gave, but you gave a brilliant example. So 
I use um, an app called Waze, which is, um, helps you get places quicker. It shows you shortcuts and routes like that. But sometimes when I use it in the morning during rush hour, of course, everyone else is on it because everyone else is using Waze. And then you have the bias from like, well, if it's redlining, how long ago was that? That was probably 20 minutes ago. And um, the data is not catching up with what's actually going on in the real world. Um, but I go back, I think you give a great example about restaurants. Um, restaurant example, like you see these recommendation systems. And again, Amazon, Uber, and Netflix have done a great job on that. They're recommending all these products and services. But they're recommending them to everybody because they have, there's no agent acting on their side. And essentially, you have the same problem in ChatGPT, right? Because I'm asking ChatGPT, it's no context of who I am as a person. So just like you said, building up these models. And um, excellent pattern recognition. And, and that's kind of the limitations here where a lot of these people are not seeing that because um, I've started to look at now, like, and again, you know, there's, whole, there's all kinds of issues around, you know, having your own agents, your own data. Like for the most part, we're giving our data away now for free. Um, it's not like we can build our own agents, our own models to act on our behalf, just like you give um, in that really good example around the uh, media industry. But isn't that kind of like the fundamental issue here that these systems can get better and better, but they have an essential limitation due to, which you've already discussed, context, building up that um, relationship with a person, knowing what their choices are. And I, now it comes to me, I think it was like, because um, it hit me, because I, I, I think you mentioned you like Indian food. I happen to like Indian food. But I might be going to a Chinese restaurant because my friends want Chinese all the time. And then all of a sudden, I'm finally with someone who agrees to go to any restaurant with me. And so stop recommending me Chinese restaurants because I actually like Indian food. So, yeah, so I'd love if you can expand yeah. on that. As, as yeah, I mean, that's, you're getting it. I mean, I'm not, the, the, it's not clear this has that much to do with ChatGPT3 per se, which is just an NLP you know, uh, device. Um, but the, the situation there was recommendation systems where, um, you could imagine AI's job is just to recommend really great things to us because it knows everything about us, right? So it recommends where everybody should go to, to you know, to, to eat at, in a restaurant. Um, uh, you know, well, um, first of all, if it does what current recommendation systems do, it just kind of independently gives a recommendation to everybody. Uh, in the real world, you have scarcity. You can't just do that because if you send 10,000 people to the same restaurant, you're going to create congestion. Or if you send uh, 10,000 people down the same street, you're going to create traffic. Um, and so, okay, you can't do that. So the centralized uh, AI system, therefore, has got to do load balancing and only send certain people to certain restaurants. Well, if its job is to be the centralized authority for all of our, all of our wishes and values, it has to take in all of our data and decide who gets to go to what restaurant. And now you can just sort of start to see the implausibility of this. This is not what we want. It's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to be effective. Um it's not going to be fair. It's going to sense, you know, you know, we'll, we'll all be suspicious of the, 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 somehow the prized people get to go to certain restaurants and we don't. Um, and so it's got to be much more of a situation like a market, which is that, you know, I push a button on my cell phone saying, Hey, I'm ready to eat dinner. And the other side of the market, which is all the restaurants take in all the, you know, the requests from everybody and they get to know something about the people. They get to say, Oh, I see what kind of food you tend to like in the past and uh, where you're located and, you know, what your price point seems to be. And, and I also have my own preferences, you know, like people from out of town or whatever. That, now we're talking about a real market where there's kind of back and forth and, you know, a mix of desires of various kinds. There's a social network, which, you know, will, you know, uh, I will get some information maybe from other people that are also in the market. Um, and now uh, there's going to be kind of maybe some bids, you know, made. I'll get a bing on my cell phone that a certain restaurant says, hey, you know, We'll make you a 10% discount offer if you come within the next 10 minutes. Um, and I'll look at it. But then I still have agency. I get to decide, will I accept that bid or not? And, and, and you're right. At that point, I might say, well, look, based on all my past history, yeah, you would have thought I loved Indian food. Um, but, you know, there's some context that you're not aware of because it's not in the past date at all that I'm aware of that makes me not want to eat Indian food tonight, you know, and uh, try something different and, and, and. And all of us want that kind of agency in all of our life's decisions. We don't want some big AI agent telling us what to do because it thinks it knows us. Uh, and 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 because it, it can't know us, really. It can't know us in the moment, how we'll react in the moment. All the world's past data is not going to do that. And so I do push back against my AI colleagues often talk about prediction systems, predictions, everything. If you can predict perfectly, we got AI. And that's just that's just wrong. Um, it, it's, it's critically wrong. Um, you can't have all the world's data that's relevant to any specific decision because if you're thinking about that decision, there's stuff that you never even realized was relevant that becomes suddenly highly relevant. Um, 
And, and so a market a way of thinking about it like that is more relevant here because markets are more slippery. They're more, you reason in the moment, you interact back and forth. Um, and, and, and real values are talked about bids and, and, you know, and values are, are, are real things I'm, you know, willing to pay for and, and so on. Um, so that's to me, the better way to start to think about it. Uh, it handles the load balancing issues because it allows us to bid and, you know, I'll pay more for something. Well, that's maybe because I have a reason to pay more. Um, and so, you know, those two threads of, of thinking have got to come together. Yeah, and AI is just so dominated in discourse. You know, if the, if the Davos people are talking about it so much, you know, why aren't they also talking about matching markets? And why aren't they talking about payments? Why aren't they talking about, you know, uh, exactly. um, medical care and, and, and so on? Uh, why so much about natural language processing? You know, it, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that, uh, that there's this exuberance. And it's really the Frankenstein exuberance. It's humans creating humans you know, human lookalikes. And, and people find that fascinating, which I understand, but at some level, after the little bit of the fascination wears off, let's be real, folks. Let's talk about what we're, you know, let's make human life better and safer, more interesting, all that, and and create being Frankensteins and creating our, our monsters um, and hoping that our monsters will be good and, and um, will, do, you know, solve problems for us. I, I just, I find that amazing naivete. Yes, Professor Jordan, again, brilliantly astute observations, but Let's wrap this up with a final question. Um, as an academic at uh, Berkeley, I know your students are always coming to you advice, for advice and um, putting aside the 1% uh, of the 1% of Davos. Um, for lots of people uh, listening to the show, whether they're um, just beginning their journey into AI, um, they may be machine learning AI practitioners, but even for people in um, various industries, as a matter of it's um, finance, energy, education, um, I think we have someone on here from the tourism industry, um, that may be enthusiastic about what's coming in AI and also have angst against it. What's, what is, what's your advice for them in dealing with the future of AI? Well, I mean, first of all, for a younger person, I just say continue to educate yourself just like in the past. You know, I mean, the steam engine came along, you know, in 1830 or whatever. Uh, there was a lot of angst and anxiety about, you know, things lost. But, you know, people that sort of studied, you know, power and, and how what you could do with it, you know, we're ready to do new things. And, and uh, similarly here, if you just kind of appreciate what it is and what it's not, and it doesn't take that long. Um, you can start to envisage a life where you incorporate it and you build around it, and you uh, and, and you will just have confidence that if you do something valuable, like you create music or you create art or you create uh, architecture or you know you can decorate homes or whatever, that you're not that, that you're not going to be replaced. I mean that that's what humans want from other humans, and uh, that, and, and this will empower you maybe to do more and do it in different ways. Um, you know. Uh, just like any tool in the past, you know, the x-ray machine empowered people to look in new ways and, and do different things. And, and this is, a, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it, it definitely, I mean, it makes us kind of, you know, our mind kind of explodes a little bit. When we think about, okay, the college essay may be, uh, you know, outmoded now because, you know, a student can literally have this thing, write an essay for them. And in the moment, you know, if I'm looking, if I'm a student, if I'm a teacher looking at 30 essays, I'm not in the classical human situation of being in an environment, in a context, and having an interaction going on for several you know, days or months where I can really evaluate if something's good or not. It's like 30 out of context essays. You know, and that's kind of, first of all, it's kind of artificial. And, and so um, uh, education have to adjust. They can't do that anymore, or not in the same way, at least. And you try to get, you know, well, students can only sit in the room, they can't have access to a computer, they have to write their essay. Probably that's, that helps. We still want to be able to write these essays that are somewhat out of context and just deliver them quickly. But also you got to set up different situations where maybe a human kind of has to learn something over time and you watch an essay evolve over longer periods of time and um, you see things that, you know, that it would uh, be hard to fake and you have to restructure education. So a, a thoughtful education person would, would start to do that and say, okay, the college essay is broken. It's gone. Um, but look, the need is still there to, you know, educate people how to express themselves. Let's think of a different way to do that and evaluate it. Uh, don't be afraid of that, uh, you know, embrace the, the novelty, you know, someone in the tourism industry, you know, um, uh, you know, there are new things that you can do here. You're, you're trying to give descriptions of trips you could take or whatever. We'll use this tool, but, you know, shape it by what's on the ground. Um, so in fact, I like to give the, I think it's a perfect example of a market. Suppose I'm trying to, I'm try I'm traveling to Sri Lanka next week. Right. And, um, I have a couple of free days. Um, I'd like to find out things I could do to, you know, attract me to hang out in Sri Lanka and, and, and do more things. 
well, I don't want chat GPT writing a little document for me. It's probably not going to know. I would like some human being who's living in Sri Lanka, who knows the facts on the ground about what's cool this week in Sri Lanka for people like me. Okay. And, and again, chat GPT doesn't know the truth. It doesn't know what's on the ground, at least current versions. And I think that will take quite some time. Um, it, it could consult with a human on the ground there and ask, Hey, is there really, is there a cool concert going on of this kind? And the human, you know, it could maybe look that up in databases and all, but there will be, you know, a human on the other side, mostly to get the truth. Um, and then a document comes back to me that's been prepared kind of in the moment, you know, a two pager on the cool things to do for someone like, you know, a 60 year old uh, academic in Sri Lanka who likes to go running and likes music. And, um, uh, and it comes to me and I look at it and I say, fantastic. And I pay for that, right? I, I pay, you know, hundred dollars. I mean, that's, that's valuable to me. And I, we've already agreed a priori, I'm going to pay that amount. And that's different from YouTube. That's different from just tourist industry copy. That's a more human uh, producer consumer linkage that a tourism industry would then support. And they would build a platform to make that kind of thing possible. Uh, I get better high quality information. I'm happier. And the person in Sri Lanka who maybe doesn't have a salary, this is how they make their money. They're happier. Why, why, do, why don't we think about it that way? And then GPT is just a uh, tool in the midst of the available uh, so that, you know, not everything is a whole two pager that someone has got to actually write from scratch, which is uh, maybe a, too much of an effort. Chat GPT would kind of get you to, you know, to tune it. Um, so anyway, I could go on, but I just hope you see this is not so, uh, so frightening and the angst, I understand it, but, uh, you know, just step back a little bit and um, and think about what humans really need and what they want and that what they can supply. Again, um, brilliant insight there, Professor Jordan. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for being a ODS speaker um, for the last few years. Thank you for appearing, appearing on the show and taking time out of your busy day. I know you travel a lot. You talk a lot at various events. So thank you so much. And we'll see you again um, in the near future. All right. My pleasure. Nice to interact with you, Seamus. Real pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, that's a wrap for today. Um, we'll see you back uh, next week with uh, Pedro Domingos um, next Friday. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye for now.